Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, good back there? This is like being at the auto show. I feel like I'm gonna introduce the new Buick Skylark. Um, so uh, this talk is about, you know, I think people have been asking all day, yeah, but how do I start? Where do I get started, right? That's kind of uh, what, this is, uh, what this is all about. Uh, so my name is Damon Edwards. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Damon Edwards. Uh, I don't have a fancy service like Gene. I just say, if, I'm gonna post the slides there later today. So if you uh, follow me on Twitter, you'll get a link to the, uh, to the slides. Um, I think I'm a pretty lucky person, maybe in a weird sort of way. I get to see inside of a lot of organizations, a lot of high-performing organizations, a lot of uh, problematic organizations, um, you know, big household names, new web startups, um, and really kind of through these two uh, things that I do. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders, uh, managing partner of DTO Solutions. Uh, we had a long history in automation consulting. Uh, say the past seven years or so, we've uh, taken a strong turn into um, organizational and bringing lean practices to um, large enterprises. A lot of, you know, kind of what we call now called DevOps consulting. Um, also involved with uh, the team over at Simplify Ops. They're the makers of Rundeck, totally separate thing, automation tool. So between those two things and then these DevOps communities, I get to see a really broad number of, uh, of companies. And, you know, I've been doing a lot lately with Gene Kim, our previous speaker, and, you know, Gene's done all this work to catalog uh, what's the difference between high-performing and low-performing companies. And, you know, they talks a lot about, or they've cataloged a lot of the artifacts, right, of, you know, they have these types of deployment processes, they do these version control, they do, you know, all these different things, they have kind of control models. Uh, but, you know, as I hear it more and more, I think about what is the real difference? What is the difference between these companies that end up looking like these other companies and those that don't? What is the thing that separates the uh, the uh, the two types of companies, right? And it's kind of realizing it's the single most important skill that any company can master. And you look at you know what really it seems too simple, but it's the ability to improve, right? They've mastered the ability to get they're good at getting better. And uh, you know when you hear a lot about what Adrian talked about at you know at Netflix, you know they're constantly involving. They didn't set out to do you know, hundreds of deployments a day. Um, it just because they got better and better over time. So, you know, that's what this talk is really about, is, is distilling down how those companies got good at, at getting better. Uh, but first I want to just make a quick note about when I'm talking about getting better uh, improvement, you know, what really are we talking about? A lot of people think of improvement as, well, anything you're doing that's making any part of your company better is, uh, is an improvement. But you know, when we talk about improvement in this context, it's really saying the only ones, the only part of improvement that really matters, uh, the only problems that really matter are those that prevent the business from reaching its goals, right? What's getting in the way of, of what we have to get done? And if you think about this DevOps context, what does that mean, right? You know, the core of any business is going from an idea to some sort of customer outcome, sort of a measurable customer outcome, right? And, you know, as the heart of the business, we know we got to give the customer what they want, when they want it, at the lowest cost possible, right? And to get there, we got to go through all kinds of um, different functional areas. You know, we cart cartoonishly call them uh, dev and ops, but fundamentally, you've got to think in mind that is what matters to the business. So the problems that matter to the business are the things that get in the way of that life cycle, right? And you know, conveniently, these are now known as DevOps problems, right? Uh, I think we use the Dev and Ops, uh, you know, cartoonishly as the the two main groups, but it could be anywhere in the organization. Anything that gets in the way of the life cycle, bottlenecks, risks, inefficiencies, stuff that's going to stop us from getting from an idea to the business result as quickly as possible. That's what matters to the business. So this is my like DevOps in one slide, right? And. Uh, it's essentially just saying, you know, all it's about is how can we remove those barriers, risks, and inefficiencies so we can do what matters for the business, which is get uh, features to market as quickly and high quality as possible and get as fast as feedback as possible to the, to the business, right? Seems pretty simple. But that's the case, you know, why aren't most organizations good at getting better, right? We've seen the examples out there. Uh, there's plenty of... of uh, uh, of companies to, to aspire to. Uh, the whole DevOps movement is filled with companies that are getting good at this. You know, what's, what's, what's getting in the way? And you think about it, the idea of, um, you know, continuous improvement's been around for, for decades, right? It's uh, W. Edwards Deming, um, you know, him, Taichi Ono, uh, sort of the, the godfathers of, of what we now know as lean process improvement. You know, that's his first presentation he gave in Japan in 1950, right? And it's really all about taking the scientific method the idea of we're going to um, 
have a hypothesis or a plan, we're going to do some experiments, we're going to study what happened, we're going to take some corrective action, and we're going to do it again, right? I mean, this has been a something that has worked in the manufacturing industry, the services industry. Uh, you know, what's what's so difficult about our industry that's stopping us from following uh, that recipe, right? If it's how to do this is obvious, why aren't why aren't more people doing it? And you know, jump right to it. The main culprit is that in our line of business, the work is not inherently visible, right? Um, you know, we're sitting in our silos. We have to do what we need to do to get to get our job done. But the end-to-end -end system, especially in a large enterprise, um, has this way of becoming basically invisible. You don't see the end-to-end -end system. You don't see the end-to-end -end part. So to kind of talk a little bit about that, let's think about the hands-on the keyboard experience, right? Maybe you're the person in one of these these silos. You know, in theory, you're thinking about. Well, I know there is this end-to-end -end process that needs to take place here. There's some, uh, you know, the goal of the business needs to be achieved, but the reality is you're just sitting in your silo, right? You get your tickets, so you get things you need to go and work on, and that's what you're working on, um, and you're really working out of context with the rest of the organization. And, you know, these local optimizations are often what are undermining and hurting, uh, you know, the organization, right? You think you're doing what's right for the organization, but you don't realize that you're actually slowing down or hurting the end-to-end -end system. You see this all the time. I'm sure you guys have been part of these where someone thinks they're doing the right thing. They end up undermining someone else's work. They end up, uh, you know, slowing somebody down, get in the way of what needs to uh, get done, right? And then. The, the flip side of this is the management experience of this, right? The work not being visible. You know, there's this management mirage, right? Which is, hey, it's going to be great. We've got this project plan. I'm going to line all my people up, and it's going to get from business idea to result as quickly as possible. But then the reality sets in, right? Everything takes too long. Everyone looks busy, uh, but not much is getting done. You know, things break. They break again. Uh, you know, on and on, right? It's the, it takes the all hands on deck heroics to get things, to get things done. And it's really worse than this, right? Because Often from the management perspective, it's a black box, right? Uh, they just know that things take too long. They know that things are breaking, but no one can put their finger on, on why. And how come, you know, we thought it was gonna look like this and it ended up looking more, more, uh, more like this. And then one of the worst parts about this is that decisions end up being made on these kind of hopeful, educated guesses, right? The gut feel, uh, the, the cor corporate folklore, uh, we think the problem's with deployment automation. So we're gonna do deployment automation. Or, oh, the network sucks, so we have to rebuild our data center, right? Is that really the problem? Nobody knows, right? It's, it's educated kind of guesses at what's, uh, what's happening. So, you know, how do, we get, how do we get good at getting better, right? I think the first one's obvious, which is make the work visible. I'm gonna talk more about that. And the second one is you have to use that visibility to align the organization. So not only do the people um, with the hands on the keyboard, but also the folks at the management layer have a consistent picture of what's actually going on inside, uh, inside our, our organization. And that kind of brings us to this notion of, uh, of DevOps Kaizen, right? So th the fact that we've, you know, over the past few years, seen all these different companies, seen folks at, at work, and noticed that the ones that are the high performers tend to have this, this, this constant uh, uh, pattern they use for, um, for self-improvement, right? So we've taken that behaviors and sort of distilled it down to kind of what are the common activities that people, that people do. And it matches a lot to a technique called Kaizen, which came out of the lean uh, manufacturing world. So in general, you know, Kaizen, it's just a fancy Japanese word for improvement. I guess to them it's a, it's a regular word, but it just means uh, an improvement, right? In the modern business context, it's about continuous improvement. Um, it's about taking the systematic scientific method approach, right? The plan, do, check, act type way of uh, experimentation. Uh, it's a total engagement of the workforce. And this is kind of a key thing. This is what a lot of the lean manufacturing, we've learned from the lean manufacturing world, which is this is not a technology problem. This is an organizational problem. So it takes, you know, um, total collaboration across the organization, management and, uh, you know, and, and technical specialties to move things in the right, in the right direction. And it's also about valuing small changes as much as large, change, large changes. We want outcomes, right? So small day-to-day -day improvements are just as important as um, you know, major, uh, major projects. And in this, kind of, in this context, Kaizen in the DevOps context is really about saying, how can we continuously improve the flow of work through the full value stream in order to improve customer, uh, customer outcomes? So if you look at companies that kind of engage in this model of continuous improvement, they might not call it DevOps guys. In fact, I don't think they do. Um, and you know, not everyone looks the same, but they kind of have these th three same types of activities that you see consistently in these organizations, right? We'll start in the middle there, which is uh, they're tracking the right metrics. They're thinking about, uh, you know, Gene you know, talked before about lead times. They're thinking about 
lead times across the end-to-end -end system. They're thinking about uh, scrap rate. Uh, you know, how often is something from uh, one part of a process not fit for purpose in the next part of the process, right? Uh, environments are a great example of this, right? How many times does someone say, oh, I need an environment, goes into a, queue, a request queue somewhere, someone pops up two weeks later, says, I've got an environment for you, you log into the box and it's all wrong, right? Whose fault is it? Nobody knows, but you either have to re-image the, 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 the machines or you got to send them back or you got to do some fiddling yourself. That's scrap, right? It's like having a bumper on an assembly line. It's not ready for the next person to do, to do their job. So, but are you tracking that as an organization? You know, mean time to detect, mean time to repair. They aren't just ops metrics. They also tell you a lot about how good are we at designing and building our systems as well. So just in general, you know, there's a consistent program across the organization to look at our service delivery um, metrics. And there's an entire different presentation all on, uh, all on that. This won't be, won't be my focus today. And then this over here, which, you know, these metrics uh, help drive this, you know, the, the, the program oversight, right? That there's a consistent management layer looking across all the different functional silos and, um, you know, really providing these kind of three inputs, right? You know, number one, the will to make change happen. Number two, you know, the resources to make change happen. And number three, you know, the follow through uh, to, you know, clear the obstacles as to what happens. And really, kind of that's it. I mean, that is the role of, of the management oversight in any continuous improvement program is to give people the context and the, the resources to make things happen, helping them clear blockers. Um, but you see what's very interesting about these organizations that are really good at getting better. It's not a top-down command and control um, command and control culture. The management layer is there to improve, empower people to make their own improvements. So much as Adrian was talking about earlier and also this morning, um, it's about uh, you know, empowering uh, the people who do the day-to-day -day work to improve their day-to-day -day work. And uh, you see some of these great success stories of the, you know, the high-flying DevOps tales. It wasn't some you know, multi-million dollar, multi-year project they embarked on. It was a basic program of continuous improvement that got them to where they, uh, where they, got, where they are. And the last piece here, someone I'll talk to most about the rest of the presentation is, and probably a new one, is this notion of you know, uh, DevOps or service delivery planning and retrospectives, right? And this is really where the work becomes, becomes visible. This is where people gain that end-to-end -end perspective um, that they were lacking so sorely in their work before. Um, in fact, Gene sort of showed this little slide uh, before and kind of talk about how this this process generally generally works, right? So usually this is done in a retrospective. Um, uh, this is done as a retrospective. This technique is done as a retrospective, and it's really about talking about. I'll show you an actual example, but it's about you know from some type of customer demand, some type you know say a VP of whatever it might be said we got to do this project, all the way through to uh, you know there was a customer outcome, it's delivered and everything's running running well. And it's really mapped at the looking for the flow of, of, of uh, artifacts and information, right? So it's, you know, when you got that message that you had to do this project, who'd you talk to? What ticket system was that in? Where'd the requirements come from? Where'd the artifacts go? Who'd you IM or who'd you call? And you kind of, you're basically mapping out um, with all your stakeholders in the room at the same time, this end-to-end -end process to get that kind of clear, consistent view of what happened across, across this uh, delivery life cycle. And there's key metrics that you're going to be looking at there, right? There's lead time, processing time, scrap rate, head count. That's also a good point to, uh, to note that. So once you've made the first pass, uh, usually do this on you know, large butcher paper or whiteboards on the wall. Um, second step is the red pen. Right, looking for what are all the wastes, the inefficiencies, the bottlenecks, what's getting in the way of, um, of us delivering, right? And often it's never within any particular part, it's usually between the different processes or where the handoffs need to occur. And to kind of kick to start this conversation, we, you know, we, we, we use the, uh, the seven deadly wastes. Come, first it came from Lean and then it came was um, the Pop and Deeks, translated it to, to Agile. But it's things like partially done work, task switching, waiting, manual work, defects, extra processes, extra features. It's basically the things that get in the way of flow. They're gonna block the flow of work through the organization. And the kind of things you're looking at more specifically is like, you know, lead times versus processing time. Processing time meaning, sorry, lead time versus processing time meaning when you ask somebody, hey, how long did it take you to do X? And they'll be like, oh, it took me, uh, you know, four hours. Look, okay, but how long from the time you got the ticket to when you finally verified it was, it was, uh, it was okay. You know, the, who'd you have to talk to and the things you had to go through and the experimentation and the, the waiting for a verification. They're like, oh, it took two days. 
right? So there you have the lead time is two days, processing time is four days, right? And that's kind of very important things to note because that's where all the time gets wasted across the the uh, the life cycle. So also things like you know the. The, the, when you know request request and approval queues, which are signs of silos, large batch sizes, scrap, uh, you know manual deployments, uh, you know where manual testing and verification happens, snowflake environments, all the different things that we know are going to get in the way are the kind of things we're going to be looking at um, in this uh, this red pen pass. And the third pass is the notion of identifying countermeasures. Same people in the room saying, okay. Now that we know all the things that are getting in our way, what are the different countermeasures we can start to put into place to counteract those things? And I'll give some examples um, in a little bit. But you want to focus on the actionable baby steps, right? We don't need a large project to say, let's redraw everything. It's what are the actionable things we can put into place that would actually um, get us moving in the right, uh, in the right direction, right? And uh, you know, at this point, it's really just kind of an ideation to say, you know, let's just get everything, everything out. And the kind of behaviors, this is the opportunity for us to start to inject kind of these DevOps behaviors that we were talking about, right? So, you know, learning fast and failing early, working in small batches, you know, standard processes making standard parts, shared ops visibility, so on and so forth. And these slides will all be up on Twitter, so you can, uh, you can get, them, uh, get them later. But, you know, step four, this is kind of where, where it turns into reality, is we've got all these ideas of these countermeasures, now let's turn them into uh, actual improvement projects, right? And we use the you know Toda Kata storyboard idea, which is hey, on one piece of paper, uh, usually a large you know posted piece of paper, let's put you know what's the process we're working on, what's the improvement we want to ma make, what's the current state, what's the target state we want to get into, how are we going to measure to know that we're in that target state, and then what are the baby steps? What are the actionable next steps we're going to do in our first you know set of improvements? Um, and then what are the obstacles or blockers, right? It's like a nice grid, grid format. And the good thing about that is now across the organization, across the dev and the ops and the product and security and all the other boundaries, we can now talk about and kind of make a sales pitch to each other to say, hey, we'll fix this part of the process if we're able to do X, Y, and, uh, and Z. And it's great for not only selling internally, kind of across horizontally, but also going up to, you know, to the management layer to explain why uh, you want to do something. It's not just a pet peeve, it's not just some, some pain you're having, but it's why it's, is it a pain to the end-to-end -end system, right? So it's a very effective technique for getting people, number one, making the work visible, number two, finding out you know, where the problems really get in the way, number three, how are we going to solve it, number four, you know, how are we going to explain it and sell it to each other, um, and a very effective way to get an organization aligned and starting to fix, to fix itself. And it's also a very good planning technique. So instead of drawing it from you know, left to right um, in a retrospective format, before we go and do something, let's draw, use the same notation to draw it out from right to left, right? Uh, you know, what are we going to do? Who do we need to do it? Um, you know, what's going to get in the way? So on and so forth. And we find that companies that learn to plan that way, kind of build this, these, uh, these value stream maps in, um, in reverse, actually end up realizing that when they plan it that way, they make much more different, make much different decisions. To say, let's start with the end in mind and work our way backwards. The project plan uh, looks a lot different than if we would have drawn it left to, uh, left to right. So let's talk about an example of this, kind of how it works. So um, did, did anybody here read the Phoenix Project, Gene Kim's book? It's talked about it. Right, so Parts Unlimited. This is actually a, not Parts Unlimited, but I changed the name to be Parts Unlimited. This is a real, a real company. But uh, to protect the uh, not so innocent, we'll say it's Parts Unlimited, and we'll say, hey, it's a, uh, uh, you know, their their big business goal is, hey, how do we pr protect the previous two billion in revenue while innovating towards the next, uh, you know, two billion in revenue without doubling our team. Currently, you know, schedule slippages, the, uh, you know, high cost of delay, uh, you know, customers are getting upset. They're looking for other, um, for other, for other providers. And in this context, uh, we'll just call them a large financial processing and inventory network, uh, making, you know, they're basically reselling to smaller, smaller um, parts distributors. And you know, everybody looks busy, right? So, you know, we've got 40 concurrent projects, but nothing gets done. Um, you know, we love doing things so much that we do them three or four times. And, uh, you know, the customers are finding the problems before we do, which is, you know, always a huge problem, the worst uh, mean time to detect of all. And most importantly, you know, the, the, the business unit leaders are pressuring to route around core IT. They're saying, hey, we should, should we outsource this? Should we go to the cloud? Um, you know, but, but there is the pressure being put on to say that, you know, our core IT is not, 
is not delivering. So after going through that that you know that, that, that Kaizen experience that I had just uh, just mentioned, uh, let's talk about what actually transpires. This is actually a real value stream map. Don't worry, you don't have to read this from here. I'll I'll zoom in, but uh, just kind of orientates you to what you're seeing. Um, again, it's the you know some type of vice president level sales process. Um, you know they did, had to do some evaluation of whether or not. The, whether or not they could take on the, the project, estimating, financial approvals, um, you know, the development planning, the uh, you know, development activity itself. These, uh, they were very much used to be an outsourced, very outsourced company. So to work with operations, they kind of treated it and they had to create these extensive build docs, uh, creating all the tickets to make everybody work. Uh, you know, they had to do all, all the network configuration, they had to do the server setup, the app deployment, do it again in production, and then off to uh, to their go live. And you know, I remember asking him to say, "Well, how long does it take you to normally do this?" And he said, "Well, it's you know, what is it? It's like uh, it's about eight or twelve different servers, a bunch of VMs. I think actually, using, sorry, sorry, Solaris zones, um, and some networking changes. And it was changed to existing app. He said probably should have taken." you know, maybe a month to do, maybe a few weeks. And it took him 11 months, right? So I said, well, why, what, what takes so long, right? So, you know, the first thing we zoomed in on here is just the notion of, let's talk about all the planning. I put planning in air quotes that, that went on here, right? So, um, from the idea of, the, from the inception of, okay, let's say the, uh, the product owner and the vice presidents decided this is something that the market wanted. They found this first customer that was going to need this. There's a high availability uh, alternative to um, to what they had offered offered before. Uh, they had some project management team that was involved with uh, determining the sales risk and delivery risk. Now, granted, they hadn't talked to, talked to anybody that actually did the delivery work. They just sort of estimated based on past projects, can we do this? Um, they said yes. They had to go in some detailed project planning. During the project planning, of course, they're calling people who are busy doing stuff over here to say, how long would it take you to do X? Pulled some number out of the air, put it into something. Uh, then they had to get financial approvals. And at that point, they hadn't really actually discussed what was gonna happen um, uh, with the people that actually had to do the work, but now they're making a financial uh, bet plus or minus 10%, the VPs are getting together and committing their teams to delivering this project that nobody really knows what's gonna happen. There's an app specification that's created. Now, of course, we asked, well, when do the ops people see the app specification? And they're like, well, they don't need to. It's an app specification. We'll send them an email with the stuff that they need, that they need to know, right? So again, ops is still not involved at this point, as Noah, even though it's mostly networking and operational changes that need to go into this. Dev does a little bit of work calls it done, right? Um, of course, what they're, what they're testing in is actually uh, their own kind of local uh, development test environment. They have this QA group that has their own test environment, so all the QA is happy in an environment that's not like dev and it's not like ops, so what's the value, right? But, you know, we're spending money doing this. Now they're creating this build-out doc, which is all those questions they ask people, they put, it in, they put it into a spreadsheet line by line, hundreds of lines, and then we're creating over 150 tickets for that spreadsheet. And that was a heroic, we use this little kind of notation for HB, heroic battle, so it's an unrealistic thing. Because they had one project manager who'd been there for years and knew how to take that spreadsheet and create 150 plus service now tickets. Um, and of course, if the schedule changed, you had to blow away all 150 tickets and you know, start all over again, right? So her name was Linda and uh, she needs a raise, right? So now, this is, the, this is the great part. This has been eight months and not a single actual work has, has happened this entire time. And you ask people, you go, people actually do the work, kind of sitting there in the back, and you're like, they're like, yeah, that's how it works. And you're like, but how, how accurate are these, how accurate is this? And they're like, eh, not very much at all. It's still either incomplete or incorrect. Well, how do you really get the information you need? Well, we just email each other, um, you know, back and forth for a few weeks after we get this. So essentially, everybody knows this train wreck is coming. Everybody knows this is eight months of, of, of work and planning that's essentially worthless, right? And this is, this is, you know, goes on and on. So this was kind of one of the first majorizations is like, shh. somebody said there's a whole lot of stupid up here, so why don't we just stop doing it, right? And so, you know, the, the kind of the key initiatives around the storage that came out, first of all, was working in smaller batches. It's just unrealistic to say we're trying to plan out months worth of work in this way. So how do we, you know, say yes, we can commit in, in a big, 
uh, to a big business bet, but we can deliver you know, smaller bits of functionality as we go. Lay down the infrastructure, build things up as we have. Getting ops early involved, um, you know, really dramatically, uh, well, first of all, having a standardized catalog. So instead of letting the business units just sort of willy-nilly pick what they want to develop, um, have ops come with the white glove service or the whole organization come with the white glove service and help them uh, drive them towards a standardized catalog. And also, uh, you know, planning and designing by those who do. That was kind of the huge one, which is anywhere that it's, you know, more than one step removed from the people who are going to do the work, they really made the hard decision that the planning is uh, essentially uh, useless. So that was kind of talking about that, that part of it. Uh, maybe near and dear to people's hearts here, Let's talk about the network side, right? We said this is a lot of networking changes that had to happen here. So imagine uh, kind of zooming in here. Um, of those 150 plus tickets that Linda was creating, right? A lot of those go, they're all in service now. A bunch of those are, are, are uh, have, a, have, a, have a field that says network, right? So the network engineering lead who uh, gets all these tickets in mass and has to go and assign them, right? And they've got you know, six different networking teams that do different parts, parts of this, each of them working out of context, each of them getting different, different, uh, different bits of it. Um, you know, need the same things, right? Oh, the address management was done, was outsourced, the IP management. So uh, it would take so long to get through this process, they would, they would uh, allocate a bunch of IP addresses by the time you go to use them. The IP management tool would say that they're stale, so therefore you'd have, you know, your IPs wouldn't, wouldn't work. Uh, missing routes, um, which always got caught at the last minute. They had, uh, you know, certificate errors. But the one that kept biting them in the ass all time and time again was uh, these F5 rules. So you have the, you know, the global traffic manager, local traffic manager, because a lot of this high availability configuration were all relied on the application, uh, you know, routing the request to the right place. So I guess the developers had to put, whether it's the cookies or URL tokens, whatever it might be, um, they had to put the right things in their app to make these. This, uh, this traffic management work, work properly, but they didn't have access to those, to those F5 machines, or the F5 uh, uh, load balancers. So they basically had a Word document or something in SharePoint that, that gave an example of what they're supposed to do. They went and did it, went through this whole release process, and uh, by the time it gets down to the F5 team, it's either incorrect or it's invalid or didn't quite work. The, the, the professional services team, which was the kind of client-facing side of it, said this is, you know, this is a problem. And all they're doing is driving all this rework back to these development teams that are off on other projects or don't have access to these environments. Um, and so just you know, weeks and weeks worth of back and forth and rework and thrash was being driven into this process because developers didn't have access to these uh, to these, um, to the F5 equipment. So actually, um, you know, the genius idea is why don't we get the GTM, LTM, F5 uh, load balancers into, into the early environments? And uh, they actually created a storyboard for this and uh, showed it to the SVP of Ops to say, look, we're losing weeks and weeks worth of time and all this thrashing or worse is getting through to, uh, to affecting, affecting our customers. Um, we need to either buy uh, more F5s um, for the development environments or we need to use, I guess they have a software version of it um, or you know, a virtual version of it and put those in our development environments. So we're sure that we're developing against production-like environments. And when they laid it out like that, you know, he, he kind of got angry, but kind of angry at himself because he's like, you guys have been asking for more F5 for you know, over a year now, and, but it was never really clear why. And it just seemed like an expensive, unnecessary, unnecessary thing. But because they laid this out like this and they told the story and explained where all the time and problem was going, basically he's like, I'm leaving here right now. I'm going to go call our F5 rep. We're either going to, they're going to give us a great deal on the, on the physical ones or they're going to give us the, the, the virtual ones for, uh, for free. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to do this. So one last uh, kind of story for you here to show how it works. This is uh, my favorite guy. There we go. Oops, sorry. One too many. So this guy here, Marvin, right? Marvin was a, a WebSphere wizard, right? I mean, he could, he had his templates. He can whip out a WebSphere configuration in, you know, 20 minutes, half hour tops. Uh, he was very good at what he, what he did. And a lot of people kind of made fun of Marvin because they all wanted to use Chef. And they're like, oh, why aren't you using Chef? This is ridiculous. Why are you doing things manually? And he's like, well, that's not really my problem. Like, it's not where I'm losing my time is it's not taking you know, days and days to get 
um, the uh, um, you know the web the applications deployed to WebSphere and configured. It's not taking that time because I'm not using Chef. And no one really understood sort of what he was talking about until we actually laid it out and saw what actually happened. So Marvin was getting the, the signal to go ahead and, and deploy. There's already this kind of long, long, long convoluted, um, 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 what do you call it? Um, drawn a blank. But it was a long process to get the artifacts over there in the first place. Marvin goes to work. He spends about 20 minutes doing the configuration he, and deployment he needs to do. But then he has to wait because there's a four hour change window and he, he doesn't have what he needs to verify the application himself. He has to wait for this, this customer facing team to come in and verify his, uh, uh, verify his changes. So he's got a four hour, he did 20 minutes worth of work, he's got a four hour window. He has to wait till the end of that window to be told that what the, app, what, what the developers gave him, the configuration wasn't correct or because it wasn't tested in a production like, in a production -like environment which means he has to wait to, for the next four hour change window which comes, two days, which comes two days later, right? So this goes on and on and on and so for essentially, if Marvin had a way to verify the applications himself, he can knock this out in 20 minutes, 30 minutes flat instead of being you know, two, three, six days worth of, uh, worth of thrashing, right? So it was kind of one of the simplest ideas that came out of this was, hey, you know, developers, why don't you give me a shell script that I can run, or any, any, any kind of script, that I can run that will verify the deployment to say, is this thing functionally in the way that you guys, that you guys expect, right? So again, it was the idea that, you know, he didn't even know who most of his developers were, but through this exercise, they understood who they were, they understood the pains they were causing each other, and he was able to uh, uh, change Marvin's life. So again, you know, there's kind of three elements of, these, uh, of this kind of Kaizen process. Right, uh, you know, the metrics, which informs what we're going to do on the planning and, and, and retrospectives. What are we trying to solve for? That's going to generate all of the countermeasures and blockers that we need to that we want to address. That all gets fed up to the program oversight to make sure it's 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 being done. And a lot of times these changes aren't major projects. It's l number one, let's just do it differently next time. Or number two, hey, maybe you know a few hours in someone's backlog, and we can you know change things and fix things. But uh, it's very important to kind of get these three pieces working together. And we see a lot of organizations that, you know, they'll go heavy on the metrics or they'll go heavy on trying to get the, the, the top-down program oversight, um, but they'll, you know, they often lose that visibility or they forget that visibility step. I think that is a critical step to bring all of this to, uh, to life. And really, it's kind of made for enterprise needs, right, which is you can scale this quickly, you can apply this technique, make it part of the daily, you know, ceremony, the retrospectives and planning uh, that you need to do across an organization. You can, you know, it's designed to span multiple organizational boundaries. It's explicitly about how do we make it visible so people have a common context and reference which to talk about the problems and go and solve them. Um, you know, it work with any number of, uh, you know, of, of, of legacy technologies. It's not about a rip and replace. It's about just fixing how we do things uh, today. Um, it's great for developing existing staff, right? That we can't just say, hey, we're going to go out and hire the best in the world, right? I mean, that just doesn't scale beyond uh, one company. Um, and you know, it, it's a self-funded initiative, right? It's one of those things where after initial seed investment, we're, by definition what we're doing is we're stealing back time from the rest of the process. So for everything we can, every win we can get, every time we can help Marvin's life, every time we can stop that F5 uh, configuration thrash, we're stealing back time that we can invest in, in making the process, the process better. And we see a lot of organizations that use that time to number one, improve their consistency of their uh, delivery to you know, their, their business partners, um, and also they use to protect their capacity, and they also used it to uh, invest more in, uh, in themselves, right? It's basically free money. And so the one big, one of the big uh, kind of pushbacks on, on end with this that we get a lot is like, hey, well, this sounds great, but this sounds like, you know, we're going to fix what's, what's in place. That sounds difficult. We don't need this. We've got this big project lined up. It's $20 million. It's going to replace all these big things, and it's going to solve all our problems, right? I mean, this is the... Uh, Common thing, and so I want to kind of talk about what we see time and time again. There's always this big, big bang transformation dream, right? Which is we're going to start here, and we're going to finish up here over a certain amount of time and a certain amount of money, and that's our project. It's going to be it's going to be great, right? The reality is this, right? Which is you know we start things don't start, think a little bit better. They start going well. We start panicking. Right around here is where everybody gets fired, right? And then maybe maybe we might make it up the other the other side. And what's really dangerous about that is that in this kind of fear and panic right here is where everybody reverts to the old behaviors. 
So all this investment, we just recreated our old crappy way of working with our new shiny stuff, right? I mean, how many cloud implementations have, uh, have, have encountered this, right? We got this cloud, it's gonna be awesome. We forgot, you know, and now suddenly this big bang change, panicking, uh, you know, abort. Now we're just treating our cloud just like we did our old physical data center, right? And so we call this the big J, right? The big J always ends in tears versus the little J's. How do we reduce, this is the whole point of continuous improvement, we reduce this pattern, which is gonna happen no matter what, into these very small increments. And we're able to iterate our way to where we wanna go. So if you stand back at any distance, it's gonna feel like that, that, that straight curve that we were, uh, straight line that we were hoping for. But the reality is, we're gonna have these little kind of dips as we go, but we're building the confidence, right? So we're able to get faster and faster at it, and the organization learns how to change. It learns how to, how to fix itself, and that's you know, how you get good at, uh, at getting better. So recap, right? Uh, it's about the business. If you're not talking about the problems that really directly block the business, you're just belly aching, so you know, stop. Uh, you know, there's these key actions we want to put into place that uh, are going to support any kind of continuous improvement, improvement program. Uh, making the work visible is the most key thing that, we can, that you, can, you can do. Um, if you do one thing, do that. And then focus on continuous improvement. You don't do this just once. You build this into the day-to-day -day lives of the people in your organization and you're able to get yourself into that continuous improvement loop. And you know, that's how the high performers came the high performers, that's how they stay the high performers, and that's how uh, you can too. So again, I'm Damon Edwards, uh, Twitter, I'll post the uh, slides there, so if that's your thing, follow me. If it's not, you just want to email me, damon at dtosolutions.com, uh, how you get a hold of me. And uh, that's it, that's any it. Yeah, absolutely, Damon, questions? thank you very much. Yeah, do we have any questions from the audience? Q&A time. We do have a question here. Let me just sure. come on to the back. I'm not going to run that quickly because I'll trip. I, uh, just from experience, what is the typical cycle time for the small J? We're talking about weeks, two weeks, four weeks? Uh, yeah. So usually people get into like a sprint, you know, cadence, right? So whatever that means. Now, if you're not an agile organization, you know, then they'll, they'll, they'll do it in, uh, uh, you know, it's much more variable. But I think the important thing is not like looking into like a, like, like, a, like a project planning cadence, looking into what do you want to do, right? So we're going to make small incremental changes and uh, remeasure and, and fire again, right? So it could be as simple as saying, okay, what can you do in the next 30 days? Just keep people in the room. So we're going to do the next 30 days. Let's, let's, let's look at this map. Let's draw this out. We're all on the same page. We know where our main problems are. What can we do in the next 30 days and go and do it? Right, and then say we'll come back in 30 days, and we're going to remeasure. Other folks say, well, okay, let's look at it as, um, you know, per uh, if we already have kind of a, a sprint cadence going on in our organization, we'll just work this into our regular retrospectives, and we'll say let's do kind of one, you know, two-day long event to start, 5%. get it all drawn out, and then every time we deliver a sprint, let's go back and revisit the board and say, do we have to draw, redraw something or cross something out or say what we're doing differently? And then maybe every quarter kind of revisit, you know, do a larger um, retrospective. So at that part, you have to kind of fold it into what fits your organizational pattern, how people like to work, and number two, uh, just where you are in the maturity process. But focus on just small incremental changes and the rest just sort of works itself, works itself out. We have one more question over here. Uh, my my question is uh, kind of around the project planning aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, I know in our my organization, project planning is a big deal. Yeah. And this seems counterintuitive to project planning. So it's how the comfort, have you... It's the, comfort, the, comfort, the comfort of it, right. How, yeah. How have you gotten out of the, we need a plan? Right. Yeah. So usually, I mean, I think the, the, the last people to change are always the, the people on the far left, the business. You know, they want to know, hey, you know, by the way, I just told Wall Street it's going to cost $40 million and it's going to be done next quarter, right? Go do it, right? So you get, you get that. Um, so I think there's techniques to look at that. I think a lot of the agile project management work you see coming out now kind of helps address that. But more importantly, I, I think um, what, what we see more and more in organizations is this kind of happens under the covers of the classic push planning waterfall for the organization. Because that's a very, until you have your house in order and you can give them the visibility and the predictability, uh, they're not going to trust you. They're going to say the reason why, it's not my big large batch push planning. And then, oh, by the way, it's so big a big batch that nine months later, I decide to come right back in the 11th hour and change my mind because, you know, it's so the business changed, right? I mean, so there's, 
it, it's hard to tell them that they're screwing you up. So it's much easier to say that, okay, I'm gonna help meet you halfway here. I'm gonna come and say, as we um, uh, onboard this work, we're gonna make sure that, uh, like for example, there was a, um, uh, a customer of ours that was doing a big VDI infrastructure. In the past, they did it as one big bang approach, and it was always a disaster. And uh, this is like the third time they went and did it, and they decided to do, say, look, first thing we're gonna do for this new, um, this other division that we're rolling this out for, we're just gonna lay down the infrastructure, and we're gonna give you, you know, one, one virtual desktop generic OS. There, we delivered something. Now let's go to the next one, the next one, the next one. Kind of like, like, like Gene was saying about the idea of thinking in feature flags, that, 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 um, that Facebook project took you know, a year plus of, of development to do, but it wasn't a big bang. They figured out how to make smaller and smaller batches and incrementally stream them through. So I, it's one of those things where, I know I'm kind of rambling here, but it's the idea of leave what's around you in place and figure out how can you reduce the batch sizes internally to yourself and then give visibility back upstream and explain to them what you're, what you're doing. And when they see you giving, you know, giving these more incremental, incremental uh, deliveries, they get excited because they see you work and they see something coming back their way. And then you can address the, the uh, how you change on the fly from there. Does that make sense? Sorry, it's kind of over the place. <laughs> Damon Edwards, thank you very much. Thanks. We appreciate that, thank you.